Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. With any luck, you're having an amazing day. We have an awful lot of news stories to get through today. A couple of them are extremely interesting, actually. So, let's kick things off with AMD's APU, known as Renault because details for the GPU inside of this thing have leaked onto the internets. Renault is scheduled to debut at CES next year, and the details for this APU look quite juicy from what we know. The GPU inside of it in particular is said to be pretty powerful, and it could put a lot of pressure on NVIDIA uh, with their lower tier GeForce cards, especially if you're building a budget gaming rig. So what we do know about this GPU is it is using the Vega architecture for the GPU. And there have been rumours it would be Vega 10 based, but yeah, there hasn't been a lot of solid information. But what's been really interesting is that a leak today from Tim Episac has actually not only provided further details concerning the number of shaders on the GPU, but also perhaps just as importantly, the clock frequency. So there's 512 shaders on this GPU, which is pretty impressive. But adding to that, we also have a clock frequency of 1.75 gigahertz, which puts this uh, GPU at around two teflops, actually a little bit under two teflops of FP32 performance, which I'm sure you'll agree, given it's, well, an APU, that is absolutely monstrous. Now, what we don't know about this clock frequency is whether that's the peak frequency, which in reality is very unlikely to hit, in other words, boost clocks, whether that's going to be the standard game frequency, and so on and so on. I suspect that Renault is going to be particularly of interest for people who are building a small form factor system, or maybe you don't do much gaming, maybe you do light gaming here or there, and it can just kind of act as a standard. It could also be quite nice as well as a secondary system in your home. And also for esports titles, this could be more than sufficient, like the Counter-Strikes of the world don't exactly take a whole lot of uh, GPU grunt, Dota, and so on and so on. So one reason I find this particularly of interest is in relation to consoles. We've seen a lot of leaks concerning the PS5's APU and the specifications. We know it's Zen-based, we know that it's got eight processor cores, uh, it's got SMT, we know the clock frequency, and so on and so on, but we've also seen some information regarding the GPU that it could be up to 1.8 or even 2 gigahertz. And some people have been very suspicious regarding that clock frequency on what is essentially a custom APU. But if uh, AMD are able to achieve 1.75 gigahertz as peak for Renault, then it does lend even more credibility to the PS5 leaks. So with the PS5's GPU, we've seen reports of 1.8 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, if it's running in backwards compatibility mode for the original PS4, then it's going to be 800 megahertz and also disable additional compute units and so on and so on. And if it's running at 911 megahertz, that would be em emulating the GPU of the PS4 Pro. And now on to a couple of Intel pieces of news, one of which I find really interesting, and that concerns Rocket Lake. Yes, I am extremely intrigued of what the heck Rocket Lake is, but we may finally have an answer. So a couple of days ago, I detailed a supposed leak for Rocket Lake, and there were a couple of things which really raised my eyebrow. The first of which was that it supposedly had only eight CPU cores, which was, well, contrary to what we'd heard so far with roadmaps. Up until that point, we'd seen that uh, Rocket Lake was 10 CPU cores, and it basically looked very similar to Comet Lake, albeit with a Gen 12 GPU. Well... Now we may have further answers. So the individual who posted that rumour said that they actually had a couple of small typos and they've since updated it with further information. They claim that the AVX support was not supposed to have been 256, instead it was supposed to have been 512. They were essentially telling us that it's a back port on the 14nm process for, you guessed it, Willow Cove which would be the architecture after Sunny Cove. Now that would basically mean that Intel, if this information is accurate, and obviously it's not been confirmed by Intel, if this information is accurate, 
They are basically reducing the number of CPU cores, but going for ridiculous amounts of single thread performance, which is a very interesting strategy. It would basically mean that for 2021, Intel believed that they can compete favorably with AMD, not necessarily in terms of the core count, but they can probably just brute force it by having eight CPU cores, which would, well, just do their best to keep up with whatever AMD are doing at the time. Now, we can presume at that point we're going to see Zen 3 at the very least that AMD are going to be competing uh, against Intel with, potentially even Zen 4. The problem is, while we do have some details concerning uh, Tiger Lake slash Willow Cove, they're very sketchy and it's very difficult to know what performance targets would be for Rocket Lake because it's like, what clock frequency? Even if we knew IPC targets for the CPU and even if we knew the number of uh, CPU cores was accurate and so on and so on, given we don't have any clue what the clock frequency for this processor would be, it's very difficult to be like, well, this is the performance prediction. I don't think it's going to be sedate in terms of clock frequency. I suspect Intel's goal in the short term is to basically do anything they can to hold on to traditional mainstream desktop performance. So if you're running an application like Adobe Premiere, or if you're doing gaming and that type of uh, stuff, yes, certainly more CPU cores are handy, particularly if you are doing something like streaming in the background, you want to do some other stuff and you're also running a game, then obviously more CPU cores equal good. Given the translation has been provided by the retired engineer and therefore we know it's 100% accurate what the translation is, obviously with machine translation it's, well, sketchy at best, it's going to be really interesting to see what Intel's plans are there for for HEDT. At the moment, they're getting, well, spanked by AMD. Let's just be honest. There are some good things you could say about Cascade Lake, the fact that it is relatively decent in terms of pricing, although you can argue that it still needs to be a couple of hundred bucks cheaper, ideally. And you can also uh, make some arguments for applications like... Uh, I don't know, deep learning, that type of thing. But in general, if you look at I.O., if you look at extreme multi-threading performance and so on and so on, the third generation thread ripper parts just absolutely are dominating what Intel can do. So it'll be interesting to see what their strategy is going into the next, uh, next generation. Oh, and one last thing before I wrap up the Rocket Lake uh, information. So one of my sources said that they weren't certain about this, but they had heard that Rocket Lake would be based on at least two different dies. The retired engineer has also said that he's heard the same thing on Twitter. My source was very uncertain. They said that it was something they'd heard in passing. I had heard from another source that it was a backport from a future architecture, but I didn't hear anything about the multi G, uh, multi dies, excuse me, from that source. But another source had told me that they had definitely heard it was multiple dies on the chip. Uh, the retired engineers was the same thing, so maybe we could potentially see that as well. I'm just throwing that in there, just kind of like an FYI. And now from one good piece of news from Intel to one that may not be so good, and it concerns XE. As many of you are aware, Intel will be getting into the discrete GPU market with a series of GPUs launching next year. There's a lot of conflicting information what the performance targets are for these GPUs, but it's generally accepted that they're going to be maybe mid-range in terms of performance based upon what we've seen from the drivers. A couple of my sources have told me that Intel are targeting mid-range as well, but at the end of the day, we're not 100% certain. But there's been an interesting post that's been circulating on the internet, and it says that the GPUs, the XE GPUs, are not doing as well as Intel had hoped. The progress for the GPUs is behind schedule, but furthermore, we're also seeing the GPUs behind their competitors in terms of energy efficiency. Additionally, it was said that there will be no AIB models at launch, there will only be reference cards from Intel themselves. Now, depending on pricing, how good the coolers are, and so on and so on, that's not necessarily a killer. It's potentially possible, though, that AIB models could come later on. Supposedly, the drivers themselves are also lagging behind what Intel were hoping for. And according to this post, Ponte Vico HPC, which is 
high-performance computing may not launch in 2021. Instead, it may launch in 2022. Just as a quick reminder, Intel have gone into some of the architectural details for Pontivico, which is the architecture which will be based on the 7nm process, and we can assume there are numerous enhancements over the architecture on the 10nm process. And we do know that they're going to be essentially targeting free markets, with gaming being a really big one, low, low power computing, so that would be mobile, that type of thing, and also high performance computing, which would be for things like the data center. So if that is being delayed until 2022, that's definitely not a good thing. If I had to throw a few pennies into this, I'm honestly very uncertain what's going on with Intel's GPUs, because I'm hearing really mixed things. A couple of my sources have told me that the GPUs are not going as well as Intel had hoped, but I've also heard from several sources that the GPUs are doing extremely well, and are even on target, and I've even heard from one of them that the June launch is almost assured. There's also the probability that uh, it will depend upon the performance tier and what your expectations are. This is Intel's first time of releasing a dedicated discrete GPU, and I'm hearing one of the big problems, this is from what a couple of people have told me, is the 10nm process from Intel. So if you've been following along with the Intel GPU rumors, you'll likely be familiar with at least two of them. The first is that we would see two different architectures, with Arctic Sound launching first, and then later on this would be followed up with Jupiter Sound. The second rumour is that these would be created on two different processes, 10nm and 7nm respectively. In layman's terms, this means that the GPUs created on the 7nm node would not just benefit from a more advanced node with the usual improvements in power efficiency, smaller uh, transistors and blah 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 blah, but would also be created using a more advanced architecture. So in short, those GPUs would uh, benefit twice over. The problem is, though, that Raja Kodori and his team, when they were penciling out, when they were designing uh, the GPUs which launch next year on the 10nm process, did not foresee the problems with Intel's 10nm node. And obviously, the 10nm node has been a fawn in Intel's side for a number of years now for numerous products. And we've seen a lot of different architecture, a lot of different processes either scaled back or held back from their launch. So, from what I'm hearing, uh, Raja Kodori basically wanted to create a more powerful GPU, but the 10nm process is just holding them back, essentially stopping them from producing a piece of silicon which would be capable of tackling, let's say, the equivalent of the RTX 2080 Ti next year. So does that mean that the 10nm GPUs which launch next year are doomed? Does that mean that Intel cannot compete at all? Well, no, they still have a pretty good shot at it, depending on the price-to-performance ratio. A lot of the stuff that's being discussed here can be ironed out, like drivers can come together at very much the last minute, and Intel does have a very talented uh, team of software developers at their disposal. Ultimately, it's going to be the price-to-performance ratio. I know I've said this ad nauseum on the channel, but while it's really tempting for people who have the budget to be able to cough up like a thousand bucks on a GPU to get really excited about that segment of the market, and believe me, I do as well, I'm a tech head, but realistically, a lot of people can't really justify spending several hundred US dollars on a graphics card. It's one of the reasons that cards such as the 1660 uh, are so popular from NVIDIA, or even AMD's own RX uh, 580 is extremely popular right now, or the 570 was uh, at some really amazing prices over uh, Cyber Monday slash Black Friday. And obviously a lot of gamers just want to spend a couple of hundred bucks, maybe 300 bucks. So if Intel can compete with a GPU which is able to put out a really decent amount of performance at, let's say, 200 to 300 US dollars, I don't necessarily think that they're going to have a disaster on their hands. I think that they're going to be actually able to produce a pretty popular product. In fact, one of the persistent rumors I'm hearing, and I did mention this in a couple of videos before, Intel want to be extremely aggressive when it comes to the pricing of their GPU. 
because basically they know that they need to get into the market and one of the easy ways to compete in any market is to charge accordingly. But unfortunately there is once again a lot of conflicting information. Personally I'm hoping for the best uh, because I definitely want a third competitor in the discrete GPU market. At the very least I'm hoping that the second generation of RDNA really puts a lot of pressure on NVIDIA. I think next year is going to be a very volatile mark, uh, time in the market with ray tracing most likely going to be normalized in the next 12 to 18 months with the next generation consoles basically supporting it as a standard feature and we know that well I say no we believe we know that Nvidia are really going to be doubling down on ray tracing for the GeForce 30 series we know that AMD are going to be supporting it with the next generation of GPUs as well although I'm hearing that uh, XE for the gaming side of things on the 10 nm process is not going to support it but it may for the 7 nm process so basically I think next year is going to be a really interesting time in the market I don't think Intel are going to be competing in the high end uh, I don't necessarily think being less efficient than their competitors is going to be like destroying their chances in the market for me it's going to be the price and performance ratio I think for a lot of people but let me know your thoughts on this one with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll <coughs> With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment and subscribe because it helps us out a ton. You can also follow us on the social media platform of your choice by, of course, finding the relevant link in the video description. But I'm going to let you all go. Apologies for sounding a little bit stuffy. I'm getting over the aftermath of my plague. But I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.